Thank you all for coming. I'm confined to my mic here, so I have to be very unmobile. Uh, I would like to talk today about webcamming as a practice uh, and the promises of webcamming. This uh, paper is in the framework of a larger project that looks at the ways in which the internet has transformed pornography and has uh, uh, transformed it from a, a literary genre into a form of communication, interactive and online, always on. And webcamming is one of the manifestations, it's one of the avenues to create a, an online relationship, an online connection that can and indeed has often a, an erotic or a sexual component. So, and then the question arises, what is uh, webcamming as a form of, of sex work uh, if it's not prostitution? And by the, way, by the way, when I say prostitution, I look at it as a positive thing, not shameful or, or a social problem, though prostitution can be a social problem or pornography. I mean, it's somewhere in between, and that's why it's tolerated also legally when people perform sexually. The law does not really, uh, is, isn't, isn't well defined on what's going on when people perform sexually in webcamming. So the starting point in my discussion is the, the debate between cyber skeptics and cyber utopians. As you probably know, uh, this is a major, I mean, it really defines the way we look at the internet. The internet started with a whole list of cyber utopians, uh, listing all the virtues and benefits of this new invention for humanity. And as we go on, uh, a growing list of cyber skeptics that have brought us to, to today and the way we view the internet and its ills and problems affecting society, affecting politics, or affecting our social lives, affecting the way in which we interact or do not interact. And the watershed point in the history of the internet is when it became uh, commercialized. So 1985 and then uh, more prominently 1991, when commercial interests, where business interests have entered the cyberspace and have uh, 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 remarkably transformed it into a business-driven, a business-driven space. So webcamming was available before it became exploited uh, by websites like Live Jasmine or uh, I'm Live to create wealth for the platform owners. So very briefly, these are platforms that still exist. The owners are immensely wealthy. Uh, just as an example, uh, Live Jasmine is owned by a Hungarian. He's the wealthiest Hungarian on the planet, uh, owning this one single platform. And what this does is really is a, is, a, is a particular example of how commercial interests transform what we do or what we did online even before there were commercial, uh, commercial interests or money involved. So people could webcam for various purposes, but on such platforms, I mean, the owners of those platforms have created an exploitative... Uh, uh, um, a platform that uses people in countries without a lot of other opportunities for livelihoods like the Philippines, Romania, where uh, uh, a large number of performers through webcamming work for their livelihoods uh, on these websites. Uh, they receive a very small uh, percentage of the uh, of, of the payments for their performances, they and the most dehumanizing aspect is a ranking system. So a performer on these platforms have to comply with 
the viewer's pleasure because they know that they are going to be ranked. And many of them, so this is based on investigations into this, on, into this uh, sphere. Uh, they are coerced in situations of one-on-one -on -one viewer and performer. They are actually coerced into doing things that they don't want to do. And oftentimes they do it at, at home in the presence of others for lack of privacy. And this is a, an extremely, so I mean, there's more and more evidence that this is a very, very, uh, I mean, uh, 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 un undignified practice for those who are pushed into this kind of practice. Also, there is a whole system of, uh, of recruiting these performers and hiring them in such a way that the owners of the platforms are not incriminated in, incriminated in any way. So this is a very, it's a, it's a dark side, but a typical side of, glo of a globalized economy where high tech, I mean high tech companies who are actually working as virtual pimps do this kind of operation, but they are, they, 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 have, they, they have legal means to distance themselves from any repercussions. And the only way to push them into admitting what they're doing, including their employees, is to shame them by investigative uh, journalism. And that's actually happening. But then uh, Chatterbait showed up. And Chatterbait, I mean, it looks similar visually when you look at the homepage of Chatterbait and those uh, uh, websites. And it was launched in 2011. Interestingly, it's a Colombian-owned company. It's not an American high-tech company. It's a company that uh, uh, evolved in the periphery, I mean, outside of the Silicon Valley or outside of the West, if you will. And when I started observing uh, Chatterbait two and a half years ago, it ranked 388 on Alexa. Right now, it ranks 144. So this means it's a, it's a huge uh, success. It is a commercial platform. In other words, the owners of the platform share 50% of the proceeds. But there are vital differences between Chatterbait and the other platforms, uh, the commercial platforms. Uh, number one, uh, the performers are autonomous and they, they, are, they, they voluntarily perform. They're not hired by anyone. There's no intermediary who uh, coerces them or finds devious ways to have them perform. Uh, and and it's, it raises a question, I mean, of, of the autonomy and the, the, the will to actually engage in such performance. Also, Chatterbait is completely free free to watch and free to participate, you can tip. So the whole que there's a whole question about the nature of tipping as a form of payment. What is tipping? Is it a form of recognition? Is it just another way of making money? I mean, th I think this is an important question. Uh, Chatterbait uh, operates on tipping. So some of the viewers have can buy tokens, which they can use for tipping, while other performers don't need to tip. Um, Number three, there's a sharing economy aspect to Chatterbait uh, in the sense that some of the performances can be, uh, I mean, some of the performances can go into a private mode. Uh, excuse me? Some of the performances could go into a private mode, but the chat part of the screen remains open for everyone. So what you get is you, you, you get into the room, but you can't see what's happening. And the sharing uh, works in sharing the information on what's happening. Hopefully what's happening for those who can watch, those who have paid a ticket, and hopefully have others buy a ticket and join. Uh, and also, Chatterbait involves micro-communities. So some of the performers, and I've followed those over time, some of the performers develop micro-communities. I mean, fans who follow them, and, there's a, and, and it's interactive. It's interactive in a way that 
governed by the owners of the platform is not meant to be abusive and can't be abusive. I mean, it's a multiple viewer situation where the performance can, can block viewers who are abusive this way or another. So I'm asking myself, uh, uh, oh, oh, okay, I want to say one more thing. There is a growing, uh, uh, there are two aspects of Chatterbait that highlight the problem of money when money enters interactions such as this, or sexual interactions or eroticized inter interactions. Number one, there is a marked difference between countries that have economic opportunities for people and countries that don't. And people that perform and come from such countries, you could see that the need for this supplemental income changes the nature of the performance. So they're willing to do more or willing to appear more, say, on a daily basis as opposed to performers who come from countries like the United States, for example, who just sporadically appear, say, once a week, twice a week, three times a week. You can see other countries where people show uh, their performances uh, even twice a day. So that's one difference. Another difference is once Chatterbait reached a tipping point in terms of making enough money, you would see producers. So you, you could see performances, you know somebody's running them, they're in the background, they are actually operating the cameras and they're telling the performers what to do. So abuse potentially can enter that way money enters and so and a lot of people can benefit from the proceeds so you can see this kind of interaction uh, that was absent before that tipping point my time is up so thank you very much So today I'm going to talk to you about an auto ethnography survey study that I did um, on the CrossFit Open. This is actually part of a much larger study, which would be my actual doctorate study, which is about influencer culture and particularly fitness influencers. So what I am interested to look at in terms of CrossFit, CrossFit is a brand and a corporation and it's also an exercise and programming regime. But CrossFit is particularly interesting because how much of it relies on social media particularly aspects of social media that relate to surveillance and this idea of monetizing the surveillance of social media. So to start, what is CrossFit? So CrossFit, and this is where the title of my program comes in, or the title of my presentation comes in, their tagline is constantly varied functional fitness. So CrossFit is a mix of gymnastics, weightlifting and cardiovascular exercises that are performed at very high intensity, but can be scaled for every individual member of the CrossFit community. Something that's really important to keep in mind when we talk about CrossFit is that it is community-based. Before I came into the presentation today, I opened Google Maps and actually found out that the closest CrossFit box is just two blocks down. So it's Astoria Barbell and CrossFit Athletic Club, I believe, so I might call in there afterwards to check. CrossFit values itself on being <coughs> measurable. So Greg Glassman was the founder of CrossFit in the year 2000. It began with just a handful of fitness enthusiasts that would work out in his garage. Garage, sorry. And it's now become 13,000 uh, boxes, which is what CrossFit calls gyms, that are in 120 countries. So I'm from Ireland, if you hadn't guessed because of my accent. So my autoethnography took place in my local CrossFit box, which is CrossFit Limerick. So the Open is a five week long international CrossFit competition that's open access. So anybody who's a member of a CrossFit gym can join the Open. So you pay a small registration fee, you enter your details online, you decide which division you will be entered in really interesting part of selecting your division is it's not just broken down by gender and age group, it's also broken down by ability or scalability. So the most elite CrossFit athletes who are often crowned the fittest people on earth perform every exercise or wad, which is workout of the day, at or ex. 
so like prescription. So data, measuring, biometrics, biomechanics, all of these things are incredibly important to CrossFit, which is a community-based program, which also becomes really scientific when you start to get to the detail of it. So my autoethnography took place from the 22nd of February to the 26th of March. The workouts for the Open are released on a Thursday, and you have to submit your score by a Monday. This means that some people will actually do the workouts twice, which is horrible because these workouts are designed to test the fittest people on earth. You often see people rolling around on the ground, sweating, really, really, really uncomfortable afterwards, but people do it twice because they want to win. They want to be crowned the fittest on earth. I, for the record, did not do a workout twice for the duration of my autoethnography. I am very much a researcher, but I also value being able to go up and down the stairs. <laughs> CrossFit Inc., which is the corporation of CrossFit, maximize their community engagement using social media. The image on the side of the screen is from Dave Castro's Instagram. David Castro is the director of the CrossFit Games. He uses social media a lot. Instagram in particular is where throughout the open, he will post clues and it starts whole conspiracy theories about what the workouts are going to be announced on Thursday. This year, there was a slight shift in the power dynamic of CrossFit and the Open in that the very last workout was left up to a public vote where any member of the CrossFit community, whether they were in the competition or not, could go on Facebook and select workout one, two or three for people to perform on Thursday and until Monday. What's really interesting about CrossFit is here with this power dynamic and we're kind of entering Foucauldian thought because I can't talk about surveillance and not talk about Foucault. This idea of the power of the institutions shifting to the public, and it's not necessarily the health and medical experts, but we're seeing this big shift within the CrossFit community of anybody can be an expert if you've got your CrossFit level one certificate training done. You can train the others, you monitor their progress, you monitor the standards of their movements, and ultimately you can judge them on their way to becoming the fittest on earth. So what's really important to CrossFit is that their program is driven by data. So in the gym, your scores for every workout that you do on the day are gonna be recorded on a whiteboard, sometimes even on chalkboards. What has happened with CrossFit a lot in the last couple of years, bear in mind it started in 2000 and now we're in 2018, is that technology has become synonymous with the CrossFit lifestyle. There is an app for everything, whether it's the WOD or Wadify app that you see here on the screen, where you see your workout of the day, the reps and the movements that you have to do, and you can record them and share them with your community or indeed with the larger global community if they're using the app. But you can also bring it down to a local level and within your like local community gym, you can see a leaderboard of who in your gym did the best that day and different rankings. So again, there's precise rules and standards for your performance. So what's interesting about this technology is that it interacts with the community aspect of CrossFit. And you start to see that people will comment on one another's scores that they've inputted in the day and said, mm, one of your two of your reps were just a little bit shy of a full depth squat a competitiveness, a hyper competitive starts to take place. So these are two particular CrossFit influencers that I kept kind of in touch with or kind of in line with when I was doing the Open this year. So on the left side of the screen is Jordan. Her YouTube channel is hashtag Jack like Jordan. And on the right, one of these to the far right is an actual CrossFit Games athlete, BK Goodmanson. And on the left of that picture is Craig Ritchie, who's based in the UK. What I think is particularly <laughs> interesting <laughs> is that these influencers <coughs> use YouTube and Instagram in particular to keep everybody up to date. What I think is really, really interesting about CrossFit is that when I'm in the gym in Limerick in Ireland, I have my phone out all of the time. We're recording one another, we're sharing each other's images and videos, just like the influencers that we watch on YouTube and on Instagram. There's a blurring of a boundary between what's online and what's offline. 
So when Baudrillard was talking about a hyper-reality or a para-reality, this lens that we see that kind of distorts what is the physical here and now. When you step into a CrossFit gym, the physical here and now is also being projected on a Facebook Live video for about 5,000 viewers if you wanted to. So we see this kind of disruption in terms of online and offline to what is online is fit and what's offline is something that could be considered an illness. CrossFit Inc. has taken up major issue with sugar and soft drinks, Pepsi and Coca-Cola. They have a very, very regulated lifestyle, which they track and monitor and share online all of the time. But they don't see themselves as being abnormal. That lifestyle is normal. That constant monitoring and tracking using MyFitnessPal, using all of their different apps, is part of the normal lifestyle. When the boundary between offline and online is blurred, you start to wonder if when I leave the gym on a Thursday evening, if I'm not tracking what I have to eat afterwards, am I suddenly abnormal? Am I not gonna be the fittest on earth anymore? As long as I have my phone in my hand and I'm connected to the CrossFit community, I'm online all of the time. I'm in a hyper reality. I'm in a para reality space. So we see that there's this convergence between online and offline and it becomes quite matrix-like and I don't know if I should always be doing squats, if I should just be waiting for the elevator, do I get up or do I get down? My phone is in my pocket, should I be tracking all of my movements all of the time? So on the right hand side of the screen you can see that this is actually the app that my local CrossFit gym in Limerick use. And you can see also that CrossFit Inc. have got a global map where you can find your local community. There's no off button. CrossFit is everywhere all of the time. As soon as you create your social media account and you let your gym owners know that you have one. The process for the open, which begins this type of convergence and the power reality, you sign up and you pay a fee. You wait for the open announcement to be done on Facebook Live on a Thursday. You're following the hashtags, you're looking at it on social media. You're assigned a judge, you perform a workout, and you submit your scores. You check your global leaderboard to see your position on it, and you repeat it five times, constantly getting feedback. Again, these are just two of the influencers that I looked at. And what was most interesting about this autoethnography what I found was that the Open challenges competitors to perform a specific type of authenticity. This type of disciplined authenticity is something that we're seeing on the rise more and more with influencers, particularly the two influencers that I watched throughout the process of the CrossFit Open. They're not elite athletes. They're just like you and me. That authenticity is incredibly clear in all of the content that they produced. The third workout in the Open this year was massively challenging. You had to do handstand walks and handstand push-ups. Both of the influencers that I showed you earlier struggled immensely with that workout, as did I in the gym, because I can't walk on my hands. <laughs> What's interesting about their content and their self-branding as a normative strategy is that even their authenticity in their content is disciplined and it's regulated. They have sponsors, they have brands, they need to get a certain amount of views or likes on Instagram and YouTube. So while there is a stratification of the elite CrossFit athletes and the everyday person, what's more interesting is to look at this disciplined authenticity and a regulated authenticity that occurs within the larger global community. So the space between the digital athletic self and the physical self is complicated and it collapses this convergence between online and offline and like Bojard said a chain of investments and reinvestments must never stop so this is where that disciplined authenticity is highlighted and I'm out of time okay thank you hi everyone hi can you hear us uh, we just want to say thank you for having us here today. We're also always very grateful to have the opportunity to share our work. I'm Elizabeth Wissinger. I'm Kristen Miller. I'm sorry, actually, but we also get, I'm not sure what I mean to do. Yes. Yes. <laughs> okay, good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks, Whitney, for helping me out. My name is Alana Reyes, and I'm really excited to be part of this panel that's kicking off to Theorizing the Web 2018. Uh, before I start, I want to mention two things. 
Uh, I'm going to be referencing some superhero media in my uh, presentation, but there won't be any spoilers. So Infinity War fans, you're safe here. <laughs> um, and second, I'm going to be doing my best to describe the visuals on my slides, both for accessibility purposes and so you know why I chose to put some pictures on my slides. Um, this first slide is easy because it's just a couple of words. Ability and technology, which are my keywords for today's presentation. Today, I want to take a closer look at the ways our differently abled bodies move through a world that's increasingly filled with technology. I also want to think about the ways that these differently abled bodies are represented in the media that we consume every day. In particular, I want to ask this question. What makes us think of specific technologies as only meant for certain bodies? So as a starting point for asking this question, I want to look at superheroes and disability in particular. Now, putting these ideas together might seem really counterintuitive at first. You might be thinking, superheroes and disability, aren't they like opposites? Well, if you think about ability as this linear spectrum, you can put ability, disability on one end and super ability on the other, but I don't like to think of ability as linear. Another way of thinking about superheroes and disability together are by thinking about how they're both distanced from what we think of as normal bodies. I also think superheroes are a great starting point to ask this question because they're everywhere today. I mean, Infinity War comes out today. Uh, there's other movies like Black Panther. There's TV shows like Gotham and like Teen Titans Go, my guilty pleasure. Uh, we see them on lunchboxes, t-shirts, so many places offline and online. So given this ubiquity of superheroes and these images, it's important to ask ourselves these two questions. How do these images of superheroes, ability, and technology shape our understandings of both those images and ourselves? And since this isn't just a one-way relationship, we should also ask this reciprocal question. How does our understanding and our embodied experience shape the creation and reification of these images about technology and superheroes? Is it possible that we are perhaps perpetuating ideas about our bodies and technology that we use by writing them into our real lives. I mentioned earlier that there are some direct links between superheroes and disability, and one really great example is a mascot team from Morgan's Wonderland, an accessible theme park in Austin, Texas. I found out about this theme park through Amy Hamry's book, Building Access, and on this slide you can see a picture of the Morgan's Wonderland logo, subtitled, A Special Place for Special Friends. Amy Hamry describes this theme park as meant for children with many levels of ability and mobility. The mascots of Morgan's Wonderland are four children called the Wonder Squad, which you'll see in the next two slides using screen grabs I got from their website. The text is a little small, but I encourage you to check out their website and learn more about the Wonder Squad. The Wonder Squad is superheroes of Morgan's Wonderland brought together by circumstance and fate. Four young heroes, quote, turning their disabilities into super abilities. We have Morgan, their leader, who uses wings and has a cognitive delay, but has emotional gifts that bestow her with wings like a butterfly. We have Rocket, the mechanical genius who built, the own, built and designed the wheelchair that he uses. X-Ray, with a visual disability, who uses a seeing eye dog. And Jet, who has cerebral palsy, but uses jet-powered crutches designed by Rocket. So these, these wheelchairs, these uh, jet-powered crutches, these are some immediately familiar images of what kind of assistive technologies can look like. But I want to take a really quick look about how we can define assistive technology because it's, it's a lot broader than just these two examples you see here. The next slide is the US government definition of assistive technology according to the Assistive Technology Act of 1998, which says, any assistive technology is any item, piece or equipment, or product system whether acquired commercially, modified or customized, that is used to increase, maintain, or improve functional capabilities of individuals with disabilities. That's a very long definition, uh, but I want to call your attention to two things. The first is that it's, uh, by definition, it is broad. It is supposed to include a wide array of technologies. But second is actually written into the definition that it's for individuals with disabilities. And I also want to remind everybody that assistive technology can take some simpler, less mechanized forms that many people use every day. For example, on this slide, you can see a picture of a curb cut or the ramps that are built into sidewalks all around the United States 
that I actually used to get up into the Museum of Moving Image today. Um, and these assistive technologies are useful for bodies with many levels of mobility. Wheelchair users were the primary users in mind when, this, when curb cuts were designed and implemented, but they also benefit people like you and me who like to walk on surfaces without stomping and getting up and down gutters, and people who use devices like strollers and other things with wheels or rollerblades for that matter. But I promised you some superhero analysis today, so let's get back to some superheroes. Uh, here are two of my favorites who use some really iconic technology. On the left we have Iron Man in his suit, and hiding in the shadows on this dark slide is Batman on the right. Uh, these are two men, two billionaires, two heroes that are by all means amazing. But these heroes are also upholding this idea that certain bodies, certain wallets, and certain ability levels have exclusive access to certain technologies. So let's not focus on these guys, because they're only going to lead to some sad analysis. <laughs> Instead, I want to tell you about this new anime that I found that I think does a great job of talking about technology and the broad reach that it can have. It is called My Hero Academia, and the poster is on this slide. Are there any fans here? Yeah? Two fans? Okay, season? Yes. Yes, please watch it. Season three is airing right now, um, and I won't spoil anything beyond what you'll see in like episodes one and two. Um, okay, so I'll, I'll leave it on this slide for a bit. Um, so this show, I love it because it's a really great, it's a really richly structured show for thinking about different ability levels and the way that societies can be built around them to accommodate them. Uh, it takes place in a fictional city in Japan where 80% of the world's population is born with a quirk or a superhuman hum ability. Now these quirks can range from things that are like really flashy, like there's one character in the show whose right hand blasts out ice and his left hand blasts out fire and he's like learning how to use them at the same time. But only 80% of the world has the quirks, so it's, what's interesting is the protagonist, who you'll see on this slide, Izuku Midoriya, was born without a quirk. And part of the storyline is how um, he navigates being in this society without a quirk. Although, tiny spoiler, he ends up inheriting a quirk um, but that's in like episode two, so you'll see it right away. Um, but, but again, it's great for thinking about ability and disability management because most of the show is him learning how to learn, use this quirk that he's inherited. Um, so I, I adore this show. Also because on this slide you can see a group of teenagers in high school uniforms. Um, of course, it wouldn't be an anime if part of it didn't take place with high school uniforms, right? Um, <laughs> My Hero Academia follows this group of teenagers as they go to high school to complete a hero course, which allows them to be certified as professional heroes in a society that employs and licenses heroes. It recognizes them beyond the way X-Men recognizes mutants, and even beyond the way like Justice League and Avengers, um, everybody's like always battling each other and they're always getting in trouble. Um, this is a really different way of conceptualizing heroes and how they can operate within society. I also really love this show because every single student gets their own hero costume. So on this slide is a picture of the students like immediately after they try on their hero costumes. I think this is later in season one. <laughs> Um, as you can see, they're really flashy. Um, they allow a lot of personality to come out for each student. But what's great is that they're specifically designed for each student's own abilities. And by putting this technology in the hands of children and students who are explicitly still learning how to use this technology and manage their own abilities, I think the anime does a fantastic job of promoting this idea that all sorts of bodies can use all sorts of technology. Even better, um, these costumes that you can see here are designed by other students at the high school. So these students at the high school, not only are they learning how to be heroes, but some of the students are learning how to design technology and make it for other students. In season two, you get to see a character called Mei Hatsume, or Hatsume Mei as they refer to her in the anime because last names are often used first in animes. Um, she's one of the characters who's learning how to make support technology. And you get to see a few episodes where she's designing this technology that both balances out people's weaknesses and amplifies other students' strengths. So, but this also leads me to another pattern that I noticed. May is characterized as a genius, a child prodigy. 
And when I thought about a lot of other media that I think that I watch that have superheroes in them, a lot of the technology designers are geniuses. For example, let's look at on the left, we have Tony Stark in his lab working with Jarvis to design something. Um, and on the right, we have Shuri from Black Panther, who is now my favorite Marvel character. Um, but she's also characterized as a genius, a child prodigy. And even returning to our friend Rocket from the Wonder Squad, in the second sentence of his description, you see he's characterized as a mechanical genius. So who cares that they're all geniuses? Why can't we just be happy that a wider array of technology designers are in the media compared to the billionaire genius playboy philanthropists that we're used to seeing? <laughs> yes, we can be really happy about this, and I'm thrilled to see Shuri and Rocket as uh, really capable and able to design their own technology. But going back to our original question of how do these ideas and representations co-constitute each other, we might still be reinforcing this idea that tech and its creation only belongs to geniuses. So I'm hopeful that as more media like academia, My Hero Academia comes out and we can continue to show more learning, tweaking, and iterative processes that go into learning and making assistive technology, um, maybe we can stop writing this idea into our own lives that assistive technologies only belong to certain people. Um, how do these images and, uh, and our understanding shape each other? That's something that you can take with you as you watch my, uh, Infinity War tonight or tomorrow or whenever you get to go see it. Um, and with that, thank you very much for listening. And please watch My Hero Academia and tweet me when you watch it so I can see your responses. <laughs>
actually be a good visual representation of what it is to live as a body under the pressures of neoliberalism. Um, and so there are a number of animating questions for this project um, that we want to talk about. The, but you know, most importantly, um, how have the internet portables and the wearable technologies put the body's resources to work? What forces will attempt to normalize and facilitate this transition? And how, fashion, how is fashion involved in this process? And what are the limits of the body when technology's elements and interfaces are increasingly organic and cellular? Is this me? Oh, yes, me. Okay. Um, so there's a lot of names up there, but basically I wanted to give you kind of the, uh, the background um, intellectually and academically where we were coming from in terms of frameworks of thinking about labor. Um, and all of these influenced my um, definition that's cut off of glamour labor, which is the work most of us carry out when we select images of optimal body and self for our Instagram account or other social media accounts. And it's a way of thinking about how we put in work to be attracted through the aid of technology, discipline, and manipulation. So glamour labor really is the work with technology to achieve a certain type of body and self that the technology actually pulls for. So different technologies pull for different selves. And thinking from the internet to social media and now to wearable tech is kind of the background of where we're coming through from with this project. One of the other frames that we're using for our analysis is um, to look at this, the, um, these varying forms of wearable technology um, through the, the sort of discourse of transhumanism and then also the um, critical approaches of um, the post-human critique. Um, and I assume that there's fairly broad familiarity in this room with these concepts, but just briefly, um, transhumanism is a anthropocentric, technocentric human enhancement ideology. It's almost often called humanity plus. Um, and it often suggests that science and technology can innovate around physical limits and social inequities. Whereas post-humanism, um, although it's kind of cut off at the bottom here, but often post-human, the word post-human crops up in transhumanist discourse as a kind of like post-technological singularity end stage of transhumanism in which humanity and technology have completely fused. Um, but post-humanism as a school of critique is post-anthropocentric. Post-human, it's a critical philosophy that applies intersectional lenses of gender, race, class, sexual orientation, ability, and age to show um, that the human is not one but many, um, and also makes room for the non-human in its analysis as well as the role of power. Um, so there are two phases of this study, and the first phase was looking at wearable technology, electronic technology, and um, we did a bi-coastal investigation in California and New York City, um, or on the East Coast anyway, uh, we talked to 25, uh, we did 25 interviews of fashion, and fashion designers and tech designers and also did participant observation at professional gatherings of the same type of people. And um, we really looked at portable and wearable tech, fashion and gender, especially with regard to the technologies designed for femme-identified women. Um, and, about women. <laughs> oh yeah, and, and um, you know, that is women for the purpose of this um, presentation is meant as inclusively um, with regards to gender. Um, so there are a number of findings that were the results of this project, um, or at least the first phase of this project, um, which probably will be familiar to anybody who studies the tech industry broadly. Um, the first and most important is that there, uh, our interviewees and our observation um, reveals that, unsurprisingly, there is a young, white, cis male monoculture of wearable tech um, research and design that leads to inattention to other demographics. Um, there are also problematic assumptions that are built into many of the projects, such as women as the, with a female body or women as potential victims. Um, many of the projects visualize, quote unquote, difficult to read emotional responses by translating biometric data. Um, and there is both extreme interest in extracting and monetizing data, as well as insufficient privacy protection for that data. And just quickly, by that programmer over there, um, this is a dress that was surprisingly designed by a woman, but it is a dress that um, it's designed to gradually grow more transparent as the wearer becomes sexually aroused. Um, so, um, in the course of this project, one of um, the things that, that emerged in our discussions was that um, we felt like we needed um, a workable definition beyond wearable technology to talk about uh, many of the projects that we were looking at, especially as wearable technology is increasingly starting to cross over into biodesign, biotech, and biofabrication. Um, and so we really like Andrew Iliadis and Isabel Peterson's definition of embodied technology as um, something that we can move forward with because it allows us to discuss not only technology that is you know, prosthetic and in contact with the skin, but technologies that are implantable, injectable, or even ingestible. Um, and that are increasingly working with the body on a cellular level. 
Um, so when we're talking about biotech and bioware, what exactly do we mean? Um, so bioware is equal parts biotechnologies that interact with and shape the human body through bacterial and other cellular channels. It's wearable tech that reads, tracks, and translates blood, sweat, and tears, converting bodily processes into data. And it also involves the biofabrication and synthetic biology, biology which engages genetic modification of organisms and processes for the production of fibers and garments. Um, and in, of interest in particular is this Kenzin patch, is a patch that you can put on your loved ones and it reads the composition of the person's sweat. It locates them, tells you how they're feeling, tells you about their health, and my, it's a lot of surveillance going on there. So <laughs> it's interesting. And we can explain this one in the Q&A when we come back. Oh, and so then the next phase of the project then was moving into really trying to understand embodied biotech. So we've expanded the study to look at embodied technology, not just wearable tech, and the interview subjects have been synthetic biologists, biodesigners, biofabricators, and wearable, wearables designers that are engaging with biological materials. Um, so, and there's also been, we've been doing participant observation at um, conferences like the one called Biofabricate, and we can talk more about exactly what biofabrication is. But well, we have an example here, um, which we'll get to in a second, and fashion conferences that also have to do with like, new materials. So, for instance, in the upper right-hand corner is... Oh, that's um, uh, Ginkgo Bioworks and Fabric Futures project that uses, um, I think, transgenic bacteria to dye fabric. And the bottom one is a, an outfit that was grown from yeast. We're running out of time. So, um, the main finding is most of the people we talked to said, yay, this field is dominated by women, so it's going to be different from what you found going on with wearable tech. Um, there are different metaphors for the body that are being used. And also there's this idea that maybe this biofabrication technology might solve some of the problems of the fashion industry in terms of waste and um, overconsumption. Um, so um, here are our questions. Yeah, some questions that we had based on our, again, our interview subjects' responses was, will this woman-dominated biofabrication field or movement actually deliver on its promises? And um, are the industrial footprint footprint of biotech fabrication and its ideological framing is really so different from the prevailing attitudes of the tech community broadly. Um, and so I wanted to close by, by talking about um, yeah, <laughs> um, something that you may have noticed throughout the course of this presentation, which is that um, in the, the marketing and display of wearables, there is repetitive use of uh, young, white, enabled, thin, feminine, generally blonde even, and partially clothed bodies to display and market these technologies. Um, and even in the most speculative corners of embodied design, um, which most of these projects represent, um, where there are more likely to be women in lead positions, um, and you might expect, therefore, more social critique, the representation of normative gender and beauty standards is basically unaltered. Um, and so while designers often feel free to push the boundaries of living matter, woman appears as a pretty narrow and inflexible category. Um, for all of the sort of messiness and viscerality and, and goop and cellulose. Um, <laughs> and so, um, you know, given that that woman seems to be written as almost biologically female, um, one might sense low investment in using these technologies to enable the lives um, and bodies of anyone beyond the already privileged. Um, so the prominent women biodesigners are also generally providing a kind of glamour labor for the less quote-unquote sexy aspects of um, the, the tech industries um, that underwrite their projects. You know, and in, it's in the, quote, the um, captions on most of these images, but many of these projects, like um, Neri Optimus project is underwritten by Stratasys. Um, this uh, 3D like gaze actuated wearable up here is underwritten by Autodesk. Um, anyway, so, um, just give me one second. So basically what we wanna ask is if it's really so revolutionary to make space in uh, STEM for the feminine if what that feminine is doing is simply reinforcing old binaries that render um, you know, femininity as inherently biological, squelchy, messy, visceral, um, and you know, that renders the body and the biological as something that should be ever ready for exploitation. Yeah. Um, and so you know, clearly there are important potentials in many of um, these technologies for citizen science and DIY medicine. So the problem is possibly not the technology, but the uses to which it's being put and for what purposes. And so we wanted to ask to close, like what might some alternatives look like to prevent this discussion from seeming potentially Luddite? Um, and one of the, the um, projects that we looked at was um, <coughs> this Embody Suit, which um, is a project that that pulls ambient data in close to the body of the wearer and makes uses haptic sensors to make the body of the wearer 
you know, aware of um, whatever kind of tech data that's in their ambient environment that they choose to be aware of. Um, so I guess we're done. But yeah, we can talk about that more. Yeah, in the we can talk about this more in the Q and A. Um, and you know, there's some of our thoughts around the slide. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so all of our panelists could come up to the front. And again, our first discussion topic is going to be tech and self knowledge. Go. Oh, and then for everybody else, uh, if you want to ask questions, I'll be running up and down with this mic. Just raise your hand, and I will try to get to everybody before we run out of time. Who wants to go first? Okay. Alana. Um, okay, so I guess the thing that got me interested in this idea, in this topic that I just presented on was, uh, you know how when you're little, or like you see kids doing this, um, they, they look at posters and things. Like on Twitter a few weeks ago, there was this video of two, two black children who were looking at this poster of uh, Black Panther, and they were like, I'm that one, and you're that one. Uh, I, I used to do that with my brother all the time when we were kids, um, and he has a visual disability. And so uh, if anyone's seen the, the original comics for Teen Titans, um, I really love that show. And one of the characters, is, his name is Cyborg. And so my brother used to say, oh, I have to be cyborg like, because I have, I use visual impairment of like, technologies. And that was something that really stuck with me because he was choosing cyborg because he felt like he had to and not because he felt like he matched with cyborg. Um, and so I guess to answer the earlier question, like how, how we see, how our study subjects see each, each other and how it informs our research, that, that was my starting point. And I think that's, more common than I think a lot of people realize or talk about. Um, so one of the things that we found when we were looking at the, the shift from the electronic to the biological in terms of wearables uh, was that a lot of the people that we talked to, many of the um, identified women, I guess, that we talked to were saying that as scientists and researchers and designers, they had they were employing different metaphors for the body, so they were going to these giant conventions of tech people. And one of them pointed out that uh, most of the people around her were talking about cogs and circuits and machines. You put that quote up there. Um, and that she and her colleagues were talking about bodies and the biome and shit and private, sorry, did I swear? Um, <laughs> private parts. But things that are traditionally coded as female and body, they are bringing into the technology via their perspective that they're bringing to it. So is that, is that because they're women? I don't know. But it's interesting that there's a different metaphor for the body, a different way of thinking of the self through this technology than the electronic, clean, dry space of like the virtual, I don't have a body, I'm in, I'm in cyberspace kind of point of view. And there's that, that distinction between what, what, what's the technology, it's like sparkies and squishies. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we all could figure out what that means, right? Yeah. Electronic engineer versus biofabrication designer growing mushroom-based leather in her lab, in her kitchen. Yeah, I think that. Like, I he, a part of the reason why I find CrossFit and <coughs> CrossFit community so interesting, and looking at it through social media and through the surveillance and through the technology is because that's how I found it, and that was how I found the community was online. If I hadn't had an Instagram account, I don't know if I would be a member of a CrossFit gym. What became even more interesting to me was that the longer I stayed in the community, the more I saw that it was diverse, but beneath the surface. So within the CrossFit competitions, there are different categories for adaptive athletes. So you will actually see people who may not be able-bodied, but they're still going to be climbing ropes and lifting barbells. And I thought that was incredibly interesting for the way that it again this reality of what it is to be the fittest on earth it doesn't always mean that you're an able-bodied person it doesn't always mean that you look like the influencers that I would have showed you in the slides not everybody is straight white and cisgender but you have to really get into the community I found you have to kind of go through the layers of surveillance and be on the apps and join the communities and follow the hashtags until you had really scratched that surface. And I think that's where I found it really interesting to apply a concept like para-reality or hyper-reality, the convergence of online and offline and this distortion of normalization around the able body 
and how technology and surveillance and social media in particular provided a really interesting gateway for that. So this idea of the self and self-knowledge and embodiment and kind of the convergence of that with technology and social media is something that I have many, many more questions about myself. Maybe if I had 25 minutes for a presentation, <laughs> but I don't, and I'll work on that for next time. <laughs> Yeah, I just wanted to say that we live in a neoliberal age with a, that has introduced a permanent and increasing moral panic about sexual issues. And that's very suffocating. So a website like Chatterbait, uh, not that we need to become cyber utopians, but we can suspend our cyber skepticism and say there are platforms and there are venues online that can allow uh, free, autonomous, potentially empowering um, sexual expression despite this rising moral panic so that's that's how it speaks to me all right we're gonna open it up for q a who's got a question right in the center and speak right into the mic of the live stream will not hear you and everyone will be sad hi um my question is for the gentleman uh do you have a sense of how sesta fosta might impact the um, the ways in which like people who are using the internet for sex work are able to do so autonomously. You, you have to explain that concept to me. Oh, okay. Um, so there's there uh, Trump just signed a law um, that uh, is about basically trying to regulate or to tamp down on um, trafficking. Uh, but many sex workers are saying that it will also impact like how they can use the internet to communicate because it's it's like seeping into all of these online spaces that they're using um, and I think there's a sense that uh, it might force these sort of more open online can expressions to go underground. Sorry. I just might be too early, I'm sorry. I don't want to do it again, I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> Legislation in the US, bad. <laughs> yeah. Did you mention the, the unmentionable? This, this yeah. unmentionable person. <laughs> uh, I thought I heard the word. Uh, yeah. Uh, should I answer now, or are we picking up more questions? No, go. I'm answer. Yeah. Sure. This kind of legislation can really, I mean, block and impede. Um, um, Venues that are autonomous and spontaneous and, and fun and do not include abuse or the level of abuse is, is, is possible but it's very limited. So yeah, this kind of, of, of inter legal interventions can, um, yeah, can, be, can be very damaging but that's what, what makes me suspend my skepticism about the internet. The early internet promise is still here with us. There's a conflict between that and commercial interests, but also the moral panic, which is a wider, wider thing that's happening uh, besides business and commercial interests. I think that the internet uh, and with the work of independent hackers, the spirit of that can still and the fact that it's global, it's not uh, restricted to U.S. law, for example, right? That means that such activities can 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 stay and thrive. Uh, so I'm suspending my skepticism. I don't want to say I'm optimistic, but yeah. Hi, uh, my question is for Louise picking up on a thread um, on how there is a parallelity between the online and offline persona and the representation. You have called this functional surveillance. But I was really um, interested in the two phrases you've mentioned of regulated authenticity and disciplined authenticity. So is the implication here that real authenticity is natural and staged and surveillance, not meant for an audience? Like, what is the juxtaposition of the actual authentic, if there is one? Well, I think it's particularly interesting if we're looking at influencers who are using social media accounts and this this idea of Instagram. So I don't know if anybody's heard of it, the fake Instagram accounts or the more real 
Instagram accounts that influencers will have, which kind of show it's this idea of the backstage theory or the behind the scenes of the perfect life, which is interesting and I think kind of oxymoronic in a way because almost all performance and almost all kind of performance of this self is regulated in a particular we think about things like when we walk into the room here today we're in a particular space we, we know we're going to be around particular people we're at a panel about body politics so what will we wear what will we do we perform an awful lot in a way that is natural and a way that's not commodified so the idea of looking at this power reality and hyper reality of disciplined authenticity is really looking at in a kind of contemporary time of neoliberalism and possibly even post-feminism, how that can be commodified. And using, looking at social media in particular, the data and the surveillance and the algorithms and this kind of algorithmic personalization, how that disciplined authenticity can be monetized and how it can be curtailed to capital interest, whether it's a cis male influencer, that, Craig Ritchie that I was talking about, or whether it's Jordan, another cisgender influencer, their authenticity can be commodified and it can be monetized in a particular way. The more authentic that they are, the more views that they get, like I said, when somebody sees them struggle in a workout, often the views on that video are going to go up. So I think that's interesting when you kind of add on that lens, that kind of hyper-real lens, and look at the kind of monetization that happens behind it. Does that answer your question? Thanks. Hi, I guess my question is for you too, is but maybe more generally for the panel. I'm just curious whether there are in, in, any um, uh, instances in which the kind of the social uh, uh, setting the pressures that you have described on people conflict with the data and if that happens, in other words, where someone might see data and say, uh, alright, well the data is saying you did a great workout but I'm looking at the video and you know I've known you a long time and I've got six other people who agree with me that it's, it wasn't that great. I, I, I mean that's maybe ridiculous because I'm just off the top of my head, but I'm just wondering if there's pressure to sort of uh, use social media and then also pressure to accept data and deny subjectivity. When, if those are ever in conflict in, in any of your work and, and how people sort of deal with that, if there is. Yeah, in the most, this open that happened just recently, a few weeks ago, there is actually a particular instance where one of the elite athletes, um, when they, rec they have to video record their open workouts when they are submitting their scores, the standard of the handstand push-ups changed this year, so it was a little bit difficult, it was or more difficult, it was measured in a particular way. So while this particular athlete's score was incredible and pushed them really high up on the leaderboard, when their video submission was under review, a lot of the members of the CrossFit community, and there's a whole Reddit thread about it, and it blew up, um, that were pointing out that half of your reps aren't meeting the standard and CrossFit had to come out with a statement and say it wasn't necessarily about this workout in particular. We know that when this athlete gets to the next stage, they're perfectly capable of doing the work that is asked for them. So it really did provide this instance of the data isn't matching up with visually what we're seeing. What became the topic of conversation for that was that it was the community that pointed that out. It wasn't CrossFit Inc. itself as a brand that said, hang on a minute, your heels are getting over the tape on the wall. It was the community that said, those reps aren't to standard. What are you going to do about it? But they are, as of now, going through to the next stage of the competition. So we'll see what happens in... I think it will be in June when the next stage of the competition is there and I imagine that the judging standards are going to be very much under the microscope of all of the people watching it on Facebook Live and all of the people looking at it on Twitter. Um, and it kind of comes back to this idea of CrossFit being a community-driven sport. But what happens when the community starts to revolt against, you know, <laughs> the fittest people on earth? Then what happens? The lay people get control again and it's great so we can just sit down on the couch <laughs> from our phones is super. <laughs> no? 
We have time for probably one or two more questions. So Alana, this is specifically for you. Um, one of the juxtapositions between uh, My Hero Academia and uh, the kind of Marvel representation of assistive technology is that assistive technology is confined to either people with uh, social connections like the Avengers, X-Men, so on and so forth, uh, or people with huge amounts of money, e.g. Uh, Tony building assistive technology for Rhodey at the end of Civil War. Whereas in My Hero Academia, this is an egalitarian uh, kind of representation of assistive technology. Uh, I, does any of that enter into your analysis or your future work? Or um, how do you think that affects the way in which we view uh, particular kinds of advanced assistive technologies? Mm, okay, so for the first part of that question, does it enter into my work? Um, I would love to turn this into a bigger project in terms of like, my actual dissertation. I'm only a second year, um, so I'm still finishing up coursework, but my eyes are kind of on this, and I think there's something that I need to unravel a little bit more. Um, and as far as your second question, sorry, can you can you repeat it? Um, <laughs> so how does the uh, how does the representation of advanced assistive technology as the domain of the super rich or the super privileged affect? Uh, our perceptions of assistive technology? I think, so th this is my opinion, and this is something I can't quite support with theory yet, but my opinion is that it kind of pigeonholes it into this, like, the, the advanced stuff anyways. It, it makes it seem like it's completely inaccessible, just on the whole. And my goal today was by saying, um, like pulling out the example of curb cuts, was to say, Yes, like we look at this really uh, advanced technology, the really elaborate, like you said, technology is kind of accessible to only a few, but we can start to pull down from that idea and pull it down into like a more accessible, for lack of a better word, uh, form of technology, especially for people who are young and either want to get into developing it themselves or maybe are just starting out to use it and they feel like they're kind of tapping into this really niche, separate thing. Um, I think by pigeonholing it in terms of, like I said, billionaire, genius, playboy, philanthropist, it kind of separates it from what is normal and what we think about as normal. And that's something that we can't discount, especially as it, we're seeing it more and more frequently. I hope that answers your question. Yeah. We have one minute. Who's got a short question? Um, this is a question for you, too, Leanne. Um, I thought your presentation was really interesting, but perhaps this is a surface, surface level question, but with all of the sensationalized media attention on Mary Oxman, mm -hmm. do you think this is really positive for her creative endeavors and her colleagues and her peers' work? Or I mean, it's kind of early to tell, but yeah. So Mary Oxman is a biofabricating MIT scientist who happens to be gorgeous and dating Brad Pitt. Perhaps we don't know they're just friends. Yeah. We actually, we, we had a picture in the slide that was like from people or something about the two of them and then we were like, ah, oh, maybe we should take that out because we don't actually have time to talk about it, but so now we can talk about it. Um, I don't know, I think, I don't, I don't, I don't is know. it a good thing? Is it a good or, thing? Yeah, is it positive for this whole... Okay. So I mean, the people we talk to would be like, hell yeah, yeah. but that's an uncritical point of view and we're trying to bring a more critical voice to it. Yeah. Um, but they are very much excited about the idea that biofabrication and synthetic biology and these new practices that aren't so new from the 70s, but whatever, um, are becoming more well-known. And there, I, I, we were just at a research site last night, Biotech Without Borders in Brooklyn, and they, there was an interesting conversation at this lesson on how to bring biology to your business, where they were saying that we need to educate Hollywood better because they're afraid of genetic modification technologies, and there's really nothing wrong with it. So there's an interesting like cultural moment happening right now where people are afraid of GMOs and the people we were in the room with last night were like, they should not be afraid, it's the way of the future. Yeah. And I think it's a, it's a mixed bag, it really is. Yeah, these, these are people who are like um, sort of evangelists for CRISPR and things like that. So um, it, has everybody, or how many people in the room have seen Mary Oxman? Yeah. 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 Okay. Let's all continue this conversation during the break. Yeah. Thank you so much for being here. Let's give a very much for round of applause to our panelists today. Thank you all for being here first thing in the conference and uh, enjoy the rest of your day.